Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our talk. Uh, the, this talk is Hadoop on OpenStack, Scaling Hadoop SwiftFS for Big Data. Uh, my, myself, uh, Drew Lehman, and uh, my colleague Chris Power are very excited to be here today um, and to, to be able to share with you uh, our story. So this is part of the user story track. Uh, and uh, so we, we will be sharing with you um, our journey. Um, we are not part of the team within Comcast that operates OpenStack. We are actually um, the largest, if not uh, one of the largest tenants on Comcast OpenStack infrastructure doing work in big data. And uh, so we will be sharing with you some of, some of how we've been leveraging that infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk first and, and be kind of high level, talk about what we're trying to accomplish um, and uh, why we're trying to accomplish it. And then Chris is going to go a little bit deeper into the actual implementation of, of what we're doing. Um, so first, um, since we are at an international event, um, I'm not going to assume that everybody knows Comcast. I'll give a little bit of background. Um, about the company. So uh, this is, you can find this sentence on our, our website. This is our um, kind of our line. We bring together the best in media and technology. We drive innovation to create the world's best entertainment and online experiences. Um, we have many different lines of business, as you can see here from high speed internet um, and Emmy, a winning, uh, Emmy winning video service that's called our X1 platform. Our IP telephony network, uh, we offer home security and automation services. We also uh, own and operate the Universal <coughs> theme parks, one of which is here in Tokyo. Um, and we have several, you know, many media properties as well. Um, so I share this with you to, to let you know that we are certainly in the big data space. We have hundreds, uh, tens of millions of customers. We have hundreds of millions of devices on our network. It is not. Um, a challenge for us to get to data sizes of scale by any means of the imagination. Um, so how our team fits in at Comcast. So uh, we are, our team is called Engineering Analysis. Um, we use OpenStack as kind of the foundational layer for what we do and we have a big data platform that is built on top of OpenStack. Uh, those blue boxes in the middle kind of represent a bunch of the different ways that we interact with that system from doing things like just basic reporting and visual, visualization of data to feature engineering, machine learning, doing exploratory <laughs> data analysis, um, ad hoc analysis, and one of the more sophisticated things we do is actually simulations of our back-end systems like content delivery networks, uh, cloud DVR systems, and whatnot. And, the reason we do all of this is basically to support the business. Um, we are uh, doing all of this analysis to provide the business with financial guidance, to provide engineering teams with design guidance for how to design these systems uh, intelligently instead of just overbuilding all of the time, hoping that uh, our systems will support future demand. Uh, and so we help the, the business intelligently uh, allocate their capital uh, to provide the best customer experience that, that we possibly can. Uh, so I will give a little bit of a Hadoop overview here. If people aren't familiar with Hadoop um, at all, I would recommend there was a talk yesterday that was uh, Hadoop and OpenStack 101. Uh, I'm not going to rehash that content at all, but I recommend that you, that was a very good presentation. Go find that online and watch that as well. Um, but I will uh, explain the basics of MapReduce here a little bit uh, to drive home one point. Um, and so, uh, you know, MapReduce came out of this uh, paper that was published by Google in, I believe it was 2003. Uh, and it's this basic concept that you have files, right? You have data in files on a distributed file system. You then perform a map operation, which reads this content from disk. The map basically maps data to key value pairs. Uh, which are then emitted. And then there's this shuffle sort phase, which involves some combination of disk I.O. and network I.O. to get the data to the appropriate place 
for the, for the reduce function, where in the reduce function, what the system does is it pulls together all of the values that have the same key, and then the reduce function takes all the associated values for that key and performs some re reduce logic on it, and then in the end emits also some key value pairs in the form of output files. So throughout this system, this was kind of predicated on the idea of that there was disk I.O. taking place at the input, in the middle, and then at the, the output as well. Um, and so that's kind of the basics of MapReduce. We've obviously, I'll get into, we've evolved a little bit from, from that uh, 12 years ago. Um, so talking a little bit how the, uh, the space has evolved, and this may be well understood for some of you, but I remember back when I was in school as a studying computer science, one of the things that was kind of explained to us is, as far as performance goes when you're writing systems, uh, you know, memory is really fast, disk is slow, and network is slower. And the thing that's changed since I was in school is now, uh, according to this chart from the Ethernet Alliance, you know, network speeds have been growing faster than disk I.O. speeds, and now networks actually now fundamentally are faster than disk I.O. Um, <clears throat> so um, we see, you know, networks doubling every 18 months versus disk I.O. every 24 months. Uh, and of course, this is, we're considering commodity hardware here, right? So, um, and then the other thing that we've seen, and I wish I could have found a, a more up-to-date chart than this. This one goes to 2009, uh, courtesy of uh, Centip, the URL down there, um, is that we've seen that the availability of main memory has been increasing like crazy um, over the last, you know, decade plus. Um, and so servers now have fundamentally more memory than they did back in 2003 when Google wrote that paper about MapReduce, right? So if you look at 2003, it was kind of at a little bit of a plateau. 2005 is when Hadoop, the open source project, was born. And then in 2012, which isn't even on this chart, there's a new project released called Apache Spark we started saying, hey, let's leverage main memory instead of relying on disk I.O. all the time, right? If we can basically load data in memory and we can kind of do this shuffle sort in memory, leverage some network I.O., that's going to go a long way for us versus having to write and read to disk every time, right? And then um, in 2014, there was the uh, Apache Tez project, which came out as well, which is a similar approach of using uh, dicyclic, uh, directed acyclic graphs as well for processing data. Um, so the, the main message here is that main memory is more abundant than it has been uh, since that original MapReduce concept came into play. Uh, this is a chart courtesy of uh, Cisco as well. So this is another thing you see is that not only the availability, but the performance of a lot of hardware uh, components has been increasing over time, right? Everything is getting more performant with one glaringly obvious exception here, which is hard disk drives. And this is commodity hardware again. Um, and so more and more, the approach in the big data space is avoid disk I.O., right? Avoid it at all costs because everything else is more performant. So what are we doing? We're doing, trying to do big data on the cloud, right? And, um, we're trying to use uh, the Swift object store, and, and Chris will clarify in more detail, but our Swift implementation is, is, is basically a Ceph implementation. Uh, so that a lot of these factors that I just shared are kind of converging to make, make this happen, right? You know, there's no way to avoid disk I.O. It's got to be persisted at some point, right? So, but that's the long pull. And when it comes down to it, network traffic is additive, right? You're always going to have to read or write to disk eventually. But um, it's proportional, and actually it's usually, in most cases, uh, smaller than disk I.O. Uh, many workloads um, that we use are actually becoming CPU bound as well, right? So there's been an introduction of columnar formats like Parquet or ORC, which ends up compressing your data down so it takes up less space. So that network hit is actually smaller, the disk I.O. hit is smaller, and you're doing some CPU, 
using some, some clock cycles in order to basically decompress or understand that data set. Um, so that's making the network hit even less uh, impactful to what we're doing. Also, as servers have more memory, we can keep, keep more of the data just in memory. And so our processes, we try to read only once and write only <coughs> once and, and try not to spill to disk whenever possible. So with all of this, data locality actually becomes less important, right? Um, and uh, the, the availability of all these you know, massively parallel memory resident systems is making this, this uh, more effective. So, um, you know, historically when people think big data and they think Hadoop, they think about it in bare metal terms, right? And we've talked to a lot of people who are doing uh, big data with OpenStack and ironic, right? Um, but when you're dealing with bare metal, it's making one fundamental assumption, right? And it's that these vertical boxes here are a server. And every server comes packaged with a certain amount of compute and a certain amount of storage, right? And so you're making the assumption that when you scale this infrastructure, your demands for both compute and storage are going to scale proportionally, which we found personally within Comcast that that's not the case, right? We have clusters, bare metal clusters, which have extreme amounts of compute utilization. Um, and as we scale them out, we don't necessarily need to scale the storage, but we need more compute. So by using... Um, an object store, you can decouple the storage and the compute from each other. And this gives you the ability, right, to scale these independently, right? Your demand for compute goes up. You can add compute without adding storage because they're decoupled, right? Or you can add storage without adding compute. You can actually do some cool things like, oops, what did I do? You can do some, you can do some things like Scale up your compute based on your utilization, right? So you've got some really big workloads going on. You can add more compute to help take off, take the load until it's done. And then, you know, in the middle of the night, maybe you don't have that much going on, so you can scale down. Um, and we can do other things, like we could potentially even run multiple clusters against the same data sets, right? No, nothing's holding the data hostage. It's in an object store. And uh, providing greater access, right? So, you know what, we could have our cluster completely spun down and ETL jobs could still be putting data in the object store, right? You don't even need to have Hadoop running to be able to store data. So there's, we find that there are a lot of advantages to structuring uh, your big data strategy using an object store. Um, so this is kind of our landscape of tools. Um, so we... Uh, we historically have been a Vertica shop, um, and we have a lot of our data in Vertica. We've been making this uh, evolution to, to big data on OpenStack over the last couple of years. Um, we have, as I said before, uh, uh, Ceph-backed uh, Swift um, with OpenStack, and we have Hadoop, uh, Spark, we are, we are using, as I mentioned before, and Presto is a, a new, new product that we're uh, currently working with as well to basically give us performance SQL access um, to data sets in, in Swift. Um, Hive as well is a, another way of, of accessing data via SQL. Pig is a uh, more of a uh, data scripting uh, language to access it. H2O provides machine learning capabilities on top of this platform. Data Mirror is a solution for um, self-service access to data, so it effectively takes data sets that are accessible through Hadoop and makes them available in a spreadsheet-like interface. It's actually uh, the combination of Data Mirror and Tableau for us is our self-service analytics story. Uh, so we're enabling other teams like engineers, subject matter experts to get in and do big data stuff without even realizing that they're doing it, uh, just training them on these tools. Um, and at this point, I'll hand over to Chris. Thanks, Drew. So uh, obviously, we've got a lot of tools here that we need to make work with uh, a number of different uh, back-end storage technologies. But I'll just point out one thing here that um, to elaborate on one of Drew's points about scaling these clusters up and down, the Presto cluster is actually running on a set of EMs that's actually beside the Hadoop cluster. Um, so we can scale them up and down independently. And, we, and we, you know, the reasons why you might want to do that 
uh, would be something like during the day we've got a lot of analysts that are working on the data and might want to run these Presto queries and get back responses in a few seconds so we can scale that up. Um, and then in the evening we might want to run a really big simulation job on our content delivery network. So the you know, folks go home that are using Presto or Hive, for example, or Datamere. Um, and they, so we'll scale that cluster down, and then we can scale up uh, either a Spark, you know, the Spark piece or the Hadoop piece. We actually run both of those on top of, uh, of Yarn on, uh, in the same cluster. Um, so what does OpenStack look like at Comcast, right? Just a few boilerplate pieces here. Vanilla distribution, multiple data centers, uh, multi-tenant, multi-region. Um, all the typical pieces that you would expect to find there. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out, right, is that we use Ceph, uh, of course, which is providing us both our Cinder storage for block devices as well as the object storage uh, for Swift. So keep that in mind as we kind of go through some of the, the explanation of how we have architected the system. Um, and stillometer for some metrics and, and heat for some orchestration as well. Uh, so what does Hadoop look like uh, on the cloud, right? So um, lots of... OpenStack folks here, I don't need to explain the benefits of the cloud, but when we think about deploying um, Hadoop onto the cloud, we, we want to design for it, right? So assume things are going to fail. Uh, try to distribute the load out across the physical hosts, both for performance but also for fault tolerance, and use persistent storage like Cinder Block Storage, right, where it's appropriate. Um, and think elastically, scale things horizontally. Um, try to scale things to meet demand, like I just described a second ago. Uh, and then return the resources when they're not in use, right? Be a good citizen of the cloud. Um, as one of the larger tenants, we can certainly take up all of the resources in the entire region if we want, um, but that's probably not a good thing at all times. And in the night it might make sense, during the day it may not. Um, and leverage automation. When you're running things at scale, you know, you, you need to automate everything. It increases the efficiency, but it also makes things repeatable. We can scale the clusters up and down and do it in a way that we feel comfortable will work in most cases. Um, so what do, what do we mean by performance and fault tolerance, right? We take advantage of the affinity, anti-affinity features of the Nova scheduler. Um, we use the anti-affinity to actually schedule the master nodes. So things like name nodes, resource managers, those sorts of things. We schedule those out across um, physical hosts, uh, both for fault tolerance. So if we lose a compute node, we don't lose both the name nodes or both the resource managers. Um, but also for performance. So from on the compute side, if you've got um, a, a whole lot of your Hadoop nodes running, um, you want to spread those out across the... the I think I did the same Just thing. Just go back. Just hit back. There you go. You want to spread those out across the physical compute nodes, both from a performance perspective, so you can sort of distribute the load on the CPU, but also the network, right? Everybody's got to go through the same NIC, uh, but also for fault tolerance. So if you, start, if you lose a compute node here or there, you don't lose a, a whole bunch of your, your, um, your, your compute, uh, sorry, physical node. You don't lo lose a lot of your compute nodes. Uh, so that's sort of our strategy there. Um, so how do we actually architect the storage on the cluster nodes themselves? So um, be it a master node, a compute node, what the, so obviously you've got, a, you've got a VM, you need some, some ephemeral root disk for your OS and that sort of thing. Uh, and then what we add to that is a, a Cinder volume. That Cinder volume serves a couple of purposes. One of those purposes is for persistent storage, like Ambari might want to store its database somewhere. Um, the name nodes need to store its indexes somewhere. So we use the Cinder volumes for that. Um, data nodes, right? We try not to use too many data nodes. We keep a small subset of our compute nodes as actually as data nodes. And then we can add um, what we call elastic nodes, which have no Cinder volume at all, no HDFS at all, um, to the cluster without needing to have those things. But we do, do use some HDFS. Um, and it can also act as, as local disk for the node manager. Um, where, it, where it might make sense, but we think there's a, a, a better option there, and that's these uh, ephemeral volumes. So we have access to both uh, root ephemeral volumes, and uh, thanks to some discussions and the nice folks at our cloud team, uh, a flavor that gives us avail availability to some ephemeral direct attached disk as well that's much bigger. Uh, we use that typically for the, um, the local disk for the node managers. Um, certainly you need enough of it, uh, so depending on how many jobs you're running on the cluster at one time, uh, or how big your workloads are, you may or may not have enough actual uh, SSD, um, or sorry, direct attached ephemeral there to, to make that effective. So we can, uh, we can then sometimes fall back to, to Cinder as well. Um, and lastly, we use Swift, right, as the uh, data lake, right, a unified central point of storage for all of the data. Uh, and as Drew said, we, we store our data in columnar formats. So most of the data that is in there is actually um, uh, using ORC uh, with Zlib compression, where uh, we use the, uh, we use um, that uh, because we're on a HDP, but it, if you're, you know, you can use Parquet or any any sort of columnar format you might like. Um, so, how much, how important is the ephemeral storage for for big data workloads? Right? Does that actually make a difference? Um, so we set out to try to figure this out. Um, 
kind of thought, all right, let's run some tests here and see what happens, right? Traditional jobs, as Drew said, are in Hadoop are somewhat write intensive, especially in the intermediate pieces where you might want to do shuffle sort, spill to disk, you've got logs and things like that. So what we can do is actually use that, that yarn node manager local uh, configuration uh, to specify where you want the local disk to be. So we will actually, um, you can say, okay, I want my compute node to use the, the direct attached storage locally, uh, and I can run the test that way, and then we'll run a scenario where we actually use the cinder volume, which actually, of course, is going over the network to Ceph, uh, and we'll try it that way. So those were the two scenarios that we came up with, uh, and we decided we'd just run Terrasort, which is a fairly common um, Hadoop benchmark, as well as DFSIO. Uh, we thought we'd see a difference with Terrasort, and maybe not so much with DFSIO, but um, we just to, the reason we did this was we just ran a quick... Um, test on the, on, the, on the ephemeral volumes from a, like an I.O. perspective, and we found that the direct attached storage was like 15 to 20 times faster, give or take, than the cinder volumes in terms of just general read, read performance, or somewhere in that neighborhood, your mileage may vary. Um, so we said, all right, this is worth actually trying. So when we tried it, we found out, yeah, in fact, um, the jobs run faster in terms of wall clock time. So TerraSort at one terabyte uh, actually ran about 30% faster than it did uh, using ephemeral storage uh, for the local disk on the compute nodes than it actually did with, um, you know, with Cinder as the, uh, as the compute uh, local storage. And for DFSIO, it didn't really make a difference, right? Because that... Uh, just a sure. the, the, the ephemeral the storage, is local SSD or local hard drive? Local, uh, is it SSD? Yeah, local SSD. Yep. So... Um, DFSIO, it didn't make a difference. That's actually just, that test is really trying to read as much data out of HDFS and put it back into HDFS as possible, uh, quickly as it can. So it's not really using a lot of intermediate stuff, so you wouldn't expect it to. Um, so how does Hadoop work on top of Swift, right? Um, some of you may know this, but essentially what there is is there's a driver layer that lives there that makes the uh, Swift REST API look like an implementation of the Hadoop file system. Um, of course, Object stores are not file systems, and we'll talk about some of the challenges there. And there are actually two different branches of code that have this driver. One is in the Apache Hadoop distribution. One of them is in the uh, Hadoop Swift file system that's part of the Sahara Extra OpenStack uh, uh, repo. We're actually using uh, the, the Sahara Extra one, and that's the one that we've made the changes to. Um, so right, this all sounds great, but what happens when you actually scale this up right, to, to a fairly reasonable size? Um, you run into a few challenges, and we did. Um, so when we attempted to do this, right, we ran into some, some issues. Uh, we saw a whole large number of splits where we wouldn't normally see the, expect to see them. Uh, the jobs took a really long time to submit to the cluster. Um, we only would ever get back like 10,000 objects. Um, and then uh, when we would write the actual output to Swift, we would notice that it would write it and then it would actually copy it, right? These are all fairly common issues that you run into when you're running Hadoop or Spark on top of an object store. Um, folks at other companies that are doing this have, have also ran into some of these things. And we also, just digging around, we, we noticed with the help of some of the folks on the, on the cloud side of the house um, that Ceph needed a little bit of tuning. Um, so a large number of input, pl input splits, this was easy, right? Um, there is no concept of blocks in a REST API-based object store in the truest sense of the world as it would be in the HDFS world, right? Um, so Swift's default block size is 32 megabytes. Most files in big data are hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes apiece. So we just raised the, uh, the block size there uh, to a point where it made sense, something like 128 megabytes, which is typically what you would run a Hadoop system at somewhere between 64 and maybe 512, depending on the, on the jobs that you're running. That fixed the problem with us having way too many input splits. That's bad because then you have a very inefficient uh, sort of system that spins up way too many maps or tasks in Spark. Um, so the next thing we came into uh, from a challenge perspective was slow launching jobs, right? We would submit the job to the cluster and it would take minutes before it actually started running on the cluster and got submitted. And, and we sort of figured out that the what Hadoop was doing was actually first trying to list all the stuff that's in the container and figure out what was supposed to be part of the input set and then it would actually make calls to every single object, either to figure out metadata about the object or to get the block location of the object, which again, doesn't really make a lot of sense uh, in the case of these, uh, these REST-based object stores, right? So this resulted in sort of performance on the big O of N side of things, which if you've got 10 or 20,000 objects in a container and your, um, your response time from the API, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an HTTP call, right? That's, that's a little bit expensive. It's not like a, an HDFS name node call, perhaps. So, um, it, it, it took a little bit of time, minutes in some cases, to submit jobs. So what are some of the approaches we thought about uh, to solve this? Um, 
There are some configurations in Hadoop you can use to actually spin up multiple threads to try to read from the file system. Uh, that doesn't work in this case because it actually is working at the directory level, uh, which would be like a container in Swift, right? So um, if you were doing multiple containers, then that would work fine. Um, some folks have actually implemented um, overridden get splits, which is the method that's actually doing all of this work. Uh, that actually works well as, and also solves some other problems. Um, but in our case, it didn't work very well because, we, as you saw from the, the sort of ecosystem of tools, if we have to implement get splits for all of these different uh, scenarios, then we, uh, we run into lots of custom code lying around. So we tried to avoid that. Um, so what did we do to fix this? Um, there we go. Um, so what we did was we actually went into the Hadoop Swift FS code and uh, essentially extended it a little bit to understand what was some stuff that was already there. So there's already the notion of being of a file system being location aware or not by default. Of course, it's not in this case. And so we sort of extended that to some of the other methods that were there, and it reduced all of this, these unnecessary calls to get all of this information that we were seeing it try to do. Um, we localized the changes just to that driver, to that one jar file, which meant we could deploy that out to the cluster, and it becomes available to Hadoop, uh, Spark, Presto, Datamir, um, any of the other tools, HivePig, all of those tools could then take advantage of it. Um, Launch the jobs faster, reduce the load on the object store, right? We're not making thousands of calls. Um, and it works across the tool ecosystem, and it approves uh, some of the interactive query experience because you don't have to wait for, the, for that to get submitted. So you can see some of the, sort of the, the, the order of magnitude. It's a flat line at this point. Um, so that was that. And then uh, we noticed that Swift only returns 10,000 objects. If you know the Swift API, you know that's the case. So we just implemented essentially basic pagination. It's part of the Swift API. It just wasn't supported in this particular um, code that we were working in here. So if it finds that the, uh, the call to get the objects returns 10,000, it will, it will just make another call. Um, the Python Swift client already does this. So we just essentially uh, mimic that behavior. Um, and we made it configurable. So if you want to ask for less, you can, although I don't know why. Um, you would want to do that. Uh, lastly, um, job output write and rename. So Hadoop, traditionally what it does is it writes all the data from a job out temporarily. And when it finishes that, it renames the, the files. That's fine in a file system, not so fine in an object store, right? In Swift, it results in essentially a copy and then a delete, which if you're write, writing out a lot of big data, gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes, maybe terabytes, that can take a long time. Um, so there's two approaches you can use to fix this. Um, basic approaches just don't do the temporary output, right? Override this, this class, uh, just have it write, find, write directly to Swift. Um, a more sophisticated approach is to actually use some local ephemeral storage, have your task write out there, and then when you're done, push that into Swift. Um, so we're actually in the process of, of working uh, through uh, this approach as well. Um, lastly, this, the Ceph architecture and tuning. So, um, uh, you know, this is some things that we came across as we scaled the jobs up with the aid of, our, of uh, the, uh, the Comcast cloud team. Um, we worked really closely with these, the folks on the team. They've been a great help to us through this process. And, and of course, this is going to continue, right? Uh, basic things that make sense if you know anything about, about, about Ceph. I, you know, I, I wasn't a, an extreme expert in Ceph when this started, but I think I have a better understanding, at least a noob understanding now. Scale things out horizontally. We use about a two and a half to one ratio of, of Ceph OSDs to the Rados gateways in this particular case. Um, enable container index sharding. Uh, increase the placement groups so it actually spreads out the, uh, the indexes on the Rados gateways across more disks that way. Um, and then we actually found that these these merge threshold and split multiple configurations were set very small, and so we were ending up with a ton of splits on the actual disk in the way that, that Ceph was, was actually writing the, the files out, which uh, led to poor performance. So we increased those, and we turned off uh, some logging, which, of course, always speeds things up. Um, so what, what lessons have we learned? Uh, get to know your open stack architecture, right? If you're going to be a big tenant and you're going to do things that are outside of the box of traditional cloud, um, you should understand how things work. You don't need to know what kinds of servers you're running, but you need to at least need to understand the topology. Uh, so we spent time doing that and just understand the impacts of the design uh, of your cluster, whether you're using ephemeral versus Ceph versus something that might be direct attached and how that impacts not only your own workloads, but the neighbors in the, in the environment with you. Um, and then uh, 
Use a, use a femoral disc on the node manager if possible, right? This is probably more true today than it will be a year or two from now when we get much bigger compute nodes with much bigger memory and things that use less intermediate uh, disk. But for now, it, it seems to make quite a bit of a difference. Understand how you're representing pseudo directories in Swift so that everybody's s using the same thing. In Swift, it actually represents them as zero byte files. So everybody needs to understand that. Um, think about how you're going to organize the data in, in your containers. Um, you might want to uh, age data off, so you, you may have a case where you've got a year's worth of data is just really too many objects to be storing in a single container for maybe performance reasons, so you might want to break those out into a, a container per month or something like that, right? Um, and then use file formats that reduce I.O. You know, we're trying to get away from that, so Parquet and ORC do that. And lastly, what are some of the next steps, future work that we're looking at? So we want to upstream the changes back into the community uh, that we made here. As I said, everything was, we tried to do it generalized and configurable, nothing specific to what we were doing. Um, we think they're, they're reasonable enhancements for folks that want to try this. Um, we have also noticed as we've gone through this journey that every single map makes a request to Keystone, right? Uh, when it spins up to get authenticated and then tries to get the object. Uh, so what ends up happening is if you spin up a really big job with say, let's say a few hundred maps simultaneously, those all try and go out to Keystone and, and authenticate. And you might have 10, 20,000 maps in your job, so you're going to end up with all of these requests against Keystone, which is basically DOSing your whole system, um, and there's other tenants there. So what we plan to do there is actually uh, make the, the requests to get the token uh, when you authenticate the first time in the driver of whatever program, Hadoop, Spark, that might be running and then just put it into the job configuration and hand that out to the cluster, to the map job, so that they can then um, use that. And then we essentially do one keystone request instead of a bunch, and then you can hit Swift directly with the token, and it speeds things up dramatically. Um, handle a large number of partitions. So if you've got a container with partitioned data, i.e. pseudo directories in there by year, day, month, every single one of those partitions can actually result in a list uh, status call when Hadoop tries to run a job. That's sort of the next level of magnitude up from what we were just talking about with the, with the multiple get object calls. Uh, so there's a couple of approaches that you can use to solve that, so we'll be looking at that as well. And then we've noticed that the maps actually um, try to get the metadata again and, and then ask for the, uh, for the object. So we're going to look to try to streamline that a bit also. Uh, and I think with that, we've got uh, some time for questions. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah, if you want to use the you mic. You can use a microphone so it's captured for posterity. Yeah, so I assume uh, at the Hadoop level, you do the uh, replicas and uh, save you to the replicant as well? Yeah, so that's a good question. So that's why we try to limit the, uh, the, the use of HDFS, right? Because your HDFS is going to replica maybe, let's say, three times. Mm -hmm. Your underlying Swift, in some cases, maybe three, maybe two, depending on you, how you have it configured. And you end up with, as some folks like to call it, a, uh, a replication amplification engine, yes. right? So the, ideally, what we'd like to do is move all of the data um, out of HDFS entirely and keep it in Swift. There we have just two or three X replica, and Hadoop doesn't do any replication at that point. So you end up with a much more cost-effective solution as well, understanding that you know, maybe you take a slight performance hit uh, there, but, but it's not actually, in our testing, we haven't found that it's all that significant because in our case, um, the Cinder volumes are on Ceph as well, so we're making a network call either way, whether it's to Swift or to Cinder. So, um, and, and then it sort of solves the problem of the replication. Yeah, very good. So the next uh, uh, question is that for the Hadoop uh, uh, workload is mainly the sequential I/O, right? So for a larger uh, chunk, do you have any uh, performance data to share on that one? Uh, I don't have any that I can share right now in terms of like like actual. Um, absolute numbers around mm -hmm. TerraSort or those sorts of things. Um, typically, yeah, we just, typically what we'll share is relative things like we did. Um, okay, but it does meet all your requirements? It does today, of, yeah. Things. I think what we found is that um, the, the, the one, we did try to run one of the simulations, essentially. We put um, some data into, uh, probably a couple hundred gigabytes of data into um, HDFS, and then we put a couple of put the same thing into Swift and ran the same exact job, which is a simulation that, that sucks all of that data in, runs the simulation, and then writes out a, a whole bunch of the results from that. Uh, and we found that the job times were within a few percentage points of one another. Um, that's again comparing cloud to cloud, not cloud to bare metal. So take that for what it's worth. Um, so uh, Ceph supports an S3 interface too, and I know I've I've seen some work on like uh, the S3 and the S3A connector in HDFS. Mm -hmm. Did you look at that 
uh, sure, yeah. and turn it off and just say it wasn't worth it? Or? No, no, we had them turn it on. And uh, for a couple of different reasons, um, we ended up sticking with, with Swift. Um, so the, the, a lot of the code in Hadoop expects you to be talking to s3.amazonaws.com or whatever the URL is for S3. So first you have to figure out how to kind of force it to talk to your own VIP or um, uh, Swift endpoint. Um, and then we happened to have it deployed in a, uh, on a port that was not port 80. Um, <laughs> I'm looking so at the death guy who by did a that. Thousand cuts, it sounded like. And uh, and and so yeah, it just it was more trouble than it was worth. And I think the um, ultimately that said, um, I actually use the AWS S3 CLI interchangeably with the Python Swift client because that is actually a tool that does play well with our configuration. So it is uh, in some ways maybe I don't want to say more mature, but just has a larger set of functionality perhaps and does some things differently than the Python Swift client might. So you can we use that interchangeably in some cases um, with it. So we've actually you know, in Swift, it's a container with objects. In S3, it's a bucket with objects. You can, inter you can access them interchangeably with either of those things. So you put data into Swift, you can see it in the, using the S3 command line interface um, in the same bucket name. So when, when working against Swift, um, but not on top of Ceph, there's a list of endpoints middleware feature that allows the um, SwiftFS to talk directly to the storage node. Is there a similar construct in Ceph? And if not, did that add a, any type of latency that you had to go through the Rados gateway instead of bypass, bypassing that proxy level? Uh, I, I, don't, I actually don't know. I haven't gotten to that, that level yet. So um, I could definitely you know, sort of find out and we can follow up for you. It's a good question, though. Um, simple question. Um, does the Sahara project have any involvement in its architecture? Um, so the, they do uh, in the sense that they are, they are sort of the ones that generated the, the driver le level that we were using. Um, and we've talked with them and said, hey, this is, this is sort of what we're doing. This is what we found. Um, you know, and they're sort of very receptive to, to us you know, working with them. Um, they didn't have any direct input into what we were doing here from that perspective. Um, but... Uh, yeah, in terms of the code and, and, and upstreaming and that sort of thing, they're very welcoming. Um, I'm not really aware of the Sahara architecture, but is it uh -huh. similar to this? I mean, I mean it, it will work. It, so it, it doesn't necessarily, we've gone into a great amount of detail around how we sort of structured the actual nodes in this case, right? Sahara gives you some control over that. Um, it lets you pull data out of HDFS. It lets you pull data out of Swift. And you can actually now, with some of the Manila features that have been talked about here, you can do things out of NFS as well. Um, so it, it, in some respects, it will play, uh, I think, fairly nicely with this. We don't have any experience yet with, uh, with Sahara internally within Comcast, though. Thank you. Sure. Um, you spoke about using the uh, testing the S3 uh, client mm -hmm. as well. And I believe in the Swift ecosystem, um, Hortonworks also has a Swift driver. So the Swift FS was the Rackspace driver. Sure. Did you try other Swift drivers? And how did you narrow it down to you want to use Swift FS? Yes, so the Apache Hadoop distribution has uh, a version of the code that was forked from, I, I, it looked like it when I looked at it, maybe a couple of years ago, um, from like around the Ice House time uh, release. So that driver was actually forked out. And so we actually you tried that one as well. It suffered from essentially the same problems. The changes that I've made, I've actually made them in both. Um, and it, seemingly they both function better in that respect. Um, there's actually then a, a fairly significant difference between sort of the ice house relief release of the Swift FS driver versus the, what's in the master branch today. Um, it's a little more sophisticated, but it suffers from actually quite a bit more severe um, performance issues in that it tries to, when it lists the directory, it tries to run get object metadata on every single thing. And then when it hands that over to Hadoop, Hadoop then calls again to get all the block locations. So it's actually, it was a little bit worse. So um, the, most of the changes I made um, are kind of compatible with both. Um, we focused our effort a little bit, but as I said, the, the stuff should work in the, and I have made the, the same changes to the, the Apache one as well. Um, Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, if there's no All more right. questions, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.